when the brown earth changes its color to green, it is spring. On March the 21st, Mesopotamia welcomes in a new year. For the Kurds, who are nomads engaged in farming, the time when the prairie turns to green is a new spring. They leave their houses, go to the fields, stay there all day and sing and dance in the vast prairie, which is their stage. The spring is here again. Horses and sheep have given birth to colts and lambs. Girls have blossomed. All are the gifts of Allah. Marco Polo once wrote with fear, the Kurds are bustling with joy as they loot the merchants. But this is a story of bygone days. The young Kurds today are all light-hearted and cheerful, and their spring dance appeared to be a sign to welcome us, the Silk Road team, to Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, a great oasis. Spreading to the south is the world of water and reeds, and nothing else, a marshland. A vast riverside district in the heart of this perfectly flat land of the Mesopotamia prairie, created by the Tigris and the Euphrates, which run forever broader. Its area is said to be 15 or 20 times as large as Lake Biwa, the largest lake in Japan. People scrape the mud together to make an island and gird the island with a wall of reed to turn it into a housing site. They put reed on the ground to reinforce the base. These are the semi-cylindrical houses, many of which are standing in the marshland. The same type of houses were built far back in history, some 5,000 years ago. Among the carvings left by the Sumas, who shouldered the dawn of civilization, we find the same cylindrical house we now see right in front of us. The walls, the pillars, and the ceiling are all made of reed. We were ushered into the drawing room. It is a spacious room occupying half the building. From beyond the partition came the voices of children and the tinkling of tableware. The inner part of the house is for women, but we were not allowed to enter.
The man who is cracking reed is the master of the house. His name is Hashim. A mat is being woven. The entire family turn out in full force to engage in this work by which they can make their living. The women dressed in dark clothes are Hashim's wives. This is his first wife. She is 34 years old. And this is his second wife. She is 21 years old. It is the pride of men in the marshland to have two or three wives. It is written in the Quran too. You may have two, three or four wives as you please, but be sure to give them equal treatment. The marshland with a history of 5,000 years is today a world of Islam. We headed for Baghdad. With Changang in the east and Byzantium in the west, Baghdad is situated in the middle. Established in the 8th century as the capital of the Abbasid dynasty, Baghdad flourished with all its glory as the largest city in the Islamic sphere. The birthplace of the well-known 1001 Knights. However, in the 13th century, the great prosperity of Baghdad, which had continued for 500 years, perished before the Mongolian army, who conquered the capital and reduced it to ashes. 700 years have elapsed since then. Baghdad today is the capital of the Republic of Iraq, a large city with a population of three million. Skyscrapers, traffic jams, crowds of people. It is a large modern city similar to any you can see in any part of the world today. Baghdad is now in a great construction boom. It is in the midst of overall reconstruction Visitors can hardly feel the presence of war between Iraq and Iran. Everything is now being renewed in Baghdad. A gigantic monument symbolizing new Baghdad. This is the monument of Saddam's Qadisiyah which was built in the full confidence of Iraq's victory in the war with Iran. This curiously shaped monument, looking like the dome of a mosque cut into two, is said to represent a sailing boat floating on the Tigris. It seems to have been erected in prayer for the abundant blessings of the Tigris and the permanent peace which the people liken to the flow of their river. Only Rashid Street in the heart of Baghdad is barely a sole reminder of the old days. Bazaars in the square are as busy as ever. On sale, among other things in the bazaars, are some hawks used for hunting, which was once a sport for the noble class. A chaykhana, a tea house. Over a cup of tea, which is a kind of black tea, 
Men talk on for hours. Looking at the men drinking tea, we felt as if we had a glimpse of a world that had long vanished, a feeling of the times of the Arabian Nights. Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia means a land between two rivers. With the Tigris as father and the Euphrates as mother, the land of Mesopotamia is an endlessly expanding prairie. From Baghdad, the two rivers flow on for a distance of some 600 kilometers until they join and pour into the sea. The difference in altitude in all this distance, however, is only 30 meters. In other words, you walk one kilometer down along the river and you are only five centimeters lower in altitude. If only this immense flatland could be irrigated, Mesopotamia would be turned into a vast, fertile crescent. This wheel is drawing water from the Euphrates. It is some 10 meters in diameter. The water scooped up by this wheel irrigates the vast prairie of Mesopotamia. In all ages, irrigation and flood control have been the major concern of the rulers in Mesopotamia. It was said that their failure in maintaining waterways would lead to the fall of their dynasty. human history which had developed in the prairie of Mesopotamia. Its heritage remains in the prairie in the form of a small hill. A sacred tower called Ziggurat with a god shrine on top is something unique to Mesopotamia. In Mesopotamia, where no natural hills or mountains are found, the ancient inhabitants had to create heights for themselves, to show off their power and to get nearer to their gods.
This is a minaret or a tower in the old city of Samara, a location some 100 kilometers to the north of Baghdad. The minaret of the mosque al Malwiya was built by the Abbasid Caliph al Mutawakkil in the 9th century. This is the tower which reminded the Europeans of the biblical tower of Babel. The tower is surrounded by a spiral staircase. It turns round and round upwards, a path which led the early believers nearer and nearer to heaven. This minaret, which symbolizes endless ascent, is one of the historical legacies of Mesopotamia, whose people aspired for spiritual heights. Since the 7th century, Muslims were creating heights everywhere. This great minaret rises in the heart of the city, skyward, drawing a spiral line. The 52-meter tall tower is the symbol of Mosul, which is the central city in the north of Iraq. Marco Polo, who visited Mosul in the 13th century, wrote, wonderful cloth called muslin is being woven here with gold and silk. The name muslin is familiar to our ears. The tradition of weaving muslin cloth, which made the name of Mosul famous, has thus been handed down, as you can see in this Arab carpet factory. Most carpet weavers are children about seven or eight years old. They work in the morning shift and go to school in the afternoon. This little girl wearing a dress made of colorful cloth, which resembles the one referred to by Marco Polo as muslin, manipulates the threads with surprising dexterity. This is a carpet woven by a seven-year-old girl. All the children we met on the Silk Road are skillful craftsmen. We are now walking about in the world of Marco Polo. Checking each and every word of the book he wrote, we continue our journey through history. In his book, Marco Polo describes Mosul as a large kingdom in which different people live. The foremost among them are the Muslims who believe in the teachings of Muhammad. Others include the followers of Christianity. In the mountain, 30 kilometers to the north of Mosul, we found a monastery which looked exactly like the one described in Marco Polo's book. St. Matty Monastery. Built alongside the mountain, it looks as if it is clinging to the mountain surface. The history of this monastery is very old. It dates far back to the 4th century. Two old Bibles are preserved in this monastery as treasures which witnessed that ancient history.
This is the Bible made of sheepskin. It was in the 8th century that the paper-making technique invented in China was introduced to this part of the world. Until then, sheepskin had been used. To produce a single volume of the Bible, the skin of 300 sheep had to be prepared. This is the Bible made of jute paper involving the technique brought from China. The paper-making technique invented in China was introduced to the Western world via the Silk Road. It was an outstanding event in the history of the Silk Road, and quite unexpectedly, we came across a witness of its history. Just below the monastery, we were able to see a small village consisting of some 40 houses. Murgi village. All the villagers here are Christians. It is quite extraordinary to have a Christian village in the midst of the Arab world, whose population is almost entirely Muslim. Village women are preparing food. The villagers even eat pork and drink liquor, which the Muslims never touch. Women here are colorfully dressed. As they are Christians, they don't have to wear dark colored chadas or to cover their faces. We saw the Christian village, Mergi, living just as it did in the age of Marco Polo. Our request, submitted to the Iraqi authorities to take aerial shots of the prairie of Mesopotamia, was turned down. We were told that this was due to the current state of emergency. There was nothing else we could do but keep on driving. In the midst of the desert, westward from Baghdad, about 300 kilometers upstream of the Euphrates, we had quite an unexpected encounter. We found a group of Japanese scientists from Kokushikan University. The leader of the excavation team is Professor Hido Fuji of Kokushikan University's Institute of Studies in Iraq. Thirteen years ago, Professor Fuji made his first visit to Iraq. Since then, he has been fascinated by this country and embarked on a long search through the history of the civilizations of Mesopotamia. 
Professor Fuji and his group are presently working on the excavation of the ruins considered to be some 4,000 years old, 2,000 years older than the Silk Road, the history of which we are tracing. In what seems to be a mere piece of stone to our eyes, Professor Fuji found an invaluable piece of history. Professor Fuji added that Mesopotamia is a treasure house of relics. Professor Fuji added that by digging up the ancient ruins, we can shed more light on the chronological records of mankind. A single piece of earthenware can lead us to a great discovery which may completely bring about the rewriting of our history of a certain period. Professor Fuji concluded that he could not trade this feeling of excitement and constant anticipation for anything else. We were deeply impressed by Professor Fuji's dedication. He lived in a tent on location and continued relentlessly digging in the desert throughout the day in the scorching heat. This is a statue of King Uta, who made the following promise to caravan traders. Ye the pedestrians and merchants who pass through the road over which my power extends, I swear to God that I will guarantee the safety of your passage. Come to Hatra and work hard as traders. Hatra, the city of caravans. We cannot talk about the Silk Road without referring to Hatra. The king of Hatra raised his right hand and swore to God to do his utmost in protecting the travelers on the Silk Road. If you are attacked by a burglar, I'll have my right hand cut off to expiate myself. So swears each of the statues of Hatra, raising its right hand. The statue of Ubal, a young girl of Yabal, has an atmosphere which reminds one of the Orient. The men of caravans who entered Hatra Castle must have felt refreshed after a long journey when they looked at the peaceful figure of Ubal. From China and India, the caravans journeyed westward, crossing the south road of Iran under the scorching sun, the same route which we have followed, and continued their journey towards the Mediterranean. Located right in between, Hatra prospered as one of the most important points on the Silk Road. Hatra, a caravan city. It was at the peak of prosperity around the first and second centuries. In China, it was the later Han era when the brave general Ban Chao sent his messenger Gang Ying to Rome, from where the emperor Marcus Aurelius dispatched the messenger to Chang'an.
In a shrine standing in the heart of the city, we found the images of camels carved in relief on a gatepost. A city of caravans and the carvings of camels are quite becoming. A suckling baby camel reminds one of the peaceful oasis on the Silk Road. Hatra is indeed a great oasis on the Silk Road. The kings invariably gave top priority to the safety of the caravans because without their trade there would be no prosperity in the city. Along with the comings and goings of the people, the cultures of the East and the West were brought into this city. This is the Sun Shrine, where the Almighty Ruler, the Sun, is enshrined. This structure called Iwan, with a magnificent arch-shaped entrance, represents the architectural style which originated in Iran to the east. This image of a human face reminds one of the Western world. The original meaning of Hatra in Arabic is people in permanent residence. It also means the place where civilization develops. We found Hatra a cultural city worthy of its name. We marveled at the beauty of the statue of Venus, which is said to have been excavated from the well by the shrine. Who on earth carved this statue? And who brought it to this part of the world? Excavation in Hatra is being continued. Numerous small hills around the shrine contain the remains of a past glory, some 2,000 years old. With the rich history of the Silk Road kept beneath, these relics remain there in peace. An ambitious project of constructing the Long Expressway No. 1 is now in progress. It starts in Basra and continues to Baghdad, then runs straight through Syria towards the Mediterranean. The construction of this road, which may be called a modern Silk Road, has been completed up to a point 150 kilometers west of Baghdad. There we saw some familiar Chinese characters. Hello, 
、中国人吗？中国人。啊，中国人ですか。啊，中国人ですか。啊，但是中国人吗？中国人，中国人。啊，呀，你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦了，辛苦中国、中国、中国、Some of them come from Xi'an, which in the Silk Road days was called Chang'an. The coincidence was somehow quite significant. Here they are, the great grandsons of the Silk Road travelers, involved in the making of a modern Silk Road. <laughs> Tok Hang, who visited Iraq in the mid 8th century, wrote Also living here are Chinese craftsmen, painters, and weavers. The artist names are Fan Shu and Liu Si, and the names of the weavers are Li Huan and Lu Li. The 300 Chinese at work now are literally constructing a silk road leading to the west. At present, no road has been constructed westward from here. Coming into sight now are the tents of the Bedouins, the inhabitants of the deserts, seen scattered here and there. The 
Bedouins are especially hospitable to their relatives and guests. The master of the house treated us to coffee. It is a sign of welcome unique to the Bedouins. It was Arabian coffee, bitter and strong, and stung the throat. For them who live in a severe and endlessly expanding desert, there's nothing more joyful than a visit by other people. All the family come out to heartily welcome the guests. In the bag of cow leather is some sheep's milk. This young woman has been making cheese since we entered the tent. Another one is also anxious to entertain us with freshly made cheese. After two and a half hours of continuous shaking, the cheese is finally ready. It tastes simple and has no unpleasant odor. The stoutness of the Bedouins is said to have been nurtured by this cheese. The Bedouin crush coffee beans and grind them for themselves. The sound travels through the vast desert and reaches the ears of other Bedouins. Coffee's ready. The Bedouins who heard the sound of coffee being ground now gather around and talk over a cup of freshly ground Arabic coffee. A sandstorm is coming. We had never met a sandstorm before, so for a moment we mistook it to be a shower. But the hot blast that preceded it proved that it was indeed a sandstorm. The sandstorm approaches, covering the entire sky. There's no alternative for us other than to run right through the sandstorm.
the vast desert expands westwards to Syria and further to the Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> 